Tonight, we're going to be debating, is gravity a hoax? And we have Ross here, Iron Horse, uh, to get us started. So you have up to 10 minutes on the floor. Thank you so much for being here, Ross, and it's all yours. Yeah, thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Grayson. Um, this was a rather impromptu debate. It only came up at the last minute in the last day or so. So um, I've written a quick introduction this morning. I'll start right away. A big thank you to Modern Day Debate for hosting this rather impromptu debate. My opponent, Grayson, for being so brave, speaking on a topic that history is no doubt going to thoroughly laugh at that intelligent human beings once cling to as modern science. The cogs of dissonance grind slowly, and I'm here to douse them with good oil in the hopes that mankind can finally return back to sanity. A 14th century English philosopher is recollected in every thinker's mind when deciding which explanation is usually the best one, the simplest. While he himself cannot be attributed as the direct author of these words, enti non sunt multiplicanda praeta necessitate, the spirit of his law and parsimony translates as entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. This is the spirit of Occam's razor. Famous inventor Nikola Tesla is renowned for multiple game-changing inventions and is often quoted, sometimes falsely, sometimes out of context, but it cannot be doubted what he meant when speaking about modern scientists of his era and speaking about Einstein's relativity theory, quoted in the 1935 New York Times, Einstein's relativity work is a magnificent mathematical garb which fascinates, dazzles, and makes people blind to the underlying errors. Another lesser known tote by Questler goes, we are all one, people are interconnected by invisible forces. Although we have freedom to think and act, we stick together like stars on the heavenly arc with unbreakable connections. These connections cannot be seen, but we can feel them. Before I move on, I find these words of wisdom most timely as well. Of all the forces of friction, the one which mostly slows down human progress is ignorance, the thing called by Buddha the greatest evil in the world. So is gravity a hoax? For that, we must ponder several, possi several possibilities. A, it's a deliberate deceitful hoax created by evil people to fool all mankind. B, it's an accidental hoax created in good faith by men trying to make sense of a world based on accidental or deliberate false premises. And C, it really isn't a hoax at all. It's truly a force unto itself, even if still not completely understood, and maybe someday we'll grasp a better understanding of it. Let's address point C first, as that's really all my opponent can claim and support anyway. The inverse square law of gravity, first proposed by Newton, says that the gravitational attraction between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. In other words, the force of gravity is inversely related to the distance between objects. This presents as a huge problem for the spinning space ball proponents because yes, indeed, this is absolutely a flat earth versus globe earth debate and gravity is one of the key necessities of the globe's existence and obviously its greatest weakness. People like to say that vacuums don't suck and while you can argue that one way, it's a bit like the push me pull you. It's a two way equation where neither explanation is right or wrong, yet both are simultaneously correct. The atmospheric pressure seeking equilibrium is the reason why when a valve is released to let air back into a vacuum chamber, forces itself back in with great veracity, but it's equally true is to say that the void within is, to suck, is sucking the air in. This can be de demonstrated with a multi-tier vacuum chamber here on Earth where due to distance, gravity must necessarily be strongest. I'll use a three-tier ch chamber for simplicity, but the same principle applies no matter how many stories are added above. All three tiers can be operated remotely and sealed off from one another or opened up. At first, the entire chamber is evacuated of all air. We'll call the ground, ground floor chamber section one, then upwards to two and three. They are sealed off altogether, then some amount of pressure is allowed into chamber one and sealed off again. Let's say we permit 10 PSI of pressure into it, which means against every wall, floor and ceiling of the chamber, the gas is exerting an even pressure in every direction, equivalent to 10 pounds for every square inch of surface. Normal atmospheric pressure being a little over 14, so it's almost two thirds of normal air pressure we don't even feel outside. If we now release a valve into chamber two, gravity is absolutely powerless to prevent the pressure from going upwards and equalizing with the void. In the principle known as Boyle's law, gases in a container exert equal pressure in all directions. And now throughout this entire space, we have a pressure gradient of just five PSI in all directions. Gravity, gravity did nothing to maintain a higher pressure at the base as it's said to do all throughout the entire surface of the spinning space ball. When we open the third chamber, the same occurs again. Gravity is useless in holding individual gas molecules downwards. Their very nature is to be free to roam and in accordance with Boyle's law, fill every available space evenly now creating a PSI of roughly three and a third throughout the entire enclosed space. If this is how gravity behaves when it is at its strongest, it becomes impossible to describe how the planet maintains a pressure gradient all the way to the void of space, 
not just because gravity itself must get weaker and weaker, but, it, but also because to necessitate the reality of their fantasy ball going around the sun, it's not just the daily rotation of 25,000 miles on its axis we must concern ourselves with, but the very necessary and impossible orbital speed around the sun. While actual rotation is merely one and a third the speed of sound, anyone who's ever watched footage of a railgun projectile understands the mind-boggling speed of a projectile moving some eight times the speed of sound, where it effortlessly pierces layers of reinforced concrete and steel-plated barriers, barriers like a hot knife through soft butter and it is often able to reach targets over 100 miles away, something impossible on a 25,000 mile circumference globe where there would be well over one mile of curvature drop hiding any possible target. Even the world's tallest building stands at just half a mile tall, the sort of curvature drop that should and must occur at just 60 miles of distance from any and every point on Earth's surface. However, the Helioists, dressing up their beliefs in mathematical garb, claim that their obloid spheroid maintains a constant speed some 10 times faster than this projectile in order to go around the sun for every 364.2 rotations of the globe on its axis, which segues neatly into our next point where all dropping objects said to be free falling in air at 9.8 meters per second squared must necessarily fall in very specific sideways direction different for every time of the day and different for every latitude in order to keep up the illusion of dropping straight down and always maintaining that constant rate of acceleration. Here's my crude diagram here. Um, hopefully can be seen. Um, we can see that objects on one side of the globe must necessarily be racing upwards faster than Mach 88 minus 9.8 meters per second squared, which would be on this side, in order to create the illusion of falling down. The objects at the rear are going the opposite, Mach 88 plus 9.8 metres per second squared. The objects moving forward on the sides uh, must intrinsically know which sideways direction to fall at least 30 times faster than 9.8 metres per second squared just to create the illusion of falling straight down. Meanwhile, on the other side of the planet, they're doing the precise opposite. People talk about raising the dead, walking on water, or turning water into wine as some sort of great miracle. But really, the everyday event of inert, dumb objects knowing intuitively exactly which direction to fall in order to create the illusion of only ever dropping straight down would have to be the greatest miracle of all time. Yet we simply take it for granted. It's not that we don't believe in some sort of force to cause the universal up and down directions we observe here on the stationary plane of Earth. However, while the true, true reason is still often debated, I personally find no greater explanation is required apart from relative density. The Earth appears flat and stationary because it is flat and stationary, and objects appear to drop straight down, give or take wind assistance, because they do simply drop straight down. An object in motion stays in motion unless another force acts upon it. Therefore, an object in free fall motion in a vacuum will drop forever unless some sort of force prevents it. This prevention force can be called resistance, and resistance comes from substance, from something tangible that we call mass. Even air itself has a resistance force, the reason why any accelerating object in free fall will eventually reach a terminal velocity and eventually come to rest, hopefully gently with the aid of a parachute in the case of a skydiver, when One reaching minute. solid ground, the place of greatest resistance. Resistance is a force due to density. Density can be described as the molecular makeup of the various elements from hydrogen as the least dense, increasing by increments all the way through to osmium, the densest naturally curling element. We generally think of lead, gold, or mercury as the most dense among metals, while metals like aluminium are least dense, therefore lighter per volume. Therefore, in simple terms, we can describe weight, the defining word behind the Latin gravitas from which we derive the term gravity is simply weight of the mass is determined by the density of the mass times the amount or volume of the mass. Relative density of one object to its environment determines if it floats, rises or sinks. It's really as simple as that. Um, I've only got mm, probably a couple of minutes left to go, so got, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I was going to say, you've only got 10 seconds, so that's probably a good place to wrap it there. So uh, thank you so much for your introductory statement there, uh, Ross. We appreciate you coming back to Modern Day Debate. And I want to remind everybody that Modern Day Debate is a neutral debate space, hosting debates on science, politics, religion. We do hope that you feel welcome here, uh, and hopefully uh, you guys are being lively in the uh, live chat there. And uh, also we do super chats at the end, so if you have a question for either of our speakers and you get it in now, it'll be asked with priority and early so uh, with that over to you grace and you have 10 minutes on the floor oh your audio is not on there you go okay 
Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Grayson. My YouTube channel is Based Theory, where I do debates against all kinds of pseudoscience, um, religion, and I also am stepping into politics a little bit for 2024. So look out for that. Anyways, today is sort of a last minute debate uh, on uh, gravity. So I sort of, you know, in the last hour or two, I kind of put together a little presentation. So let me just share that. Um, so you can all you all can see my screen and everything. Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, perfect. So Time yeah, now. So I'm gonna start out talking about like what is gravity because I see a lot of people confused about what this is. So there's two answers. Um, in Newtonian mechanics, gravity is an attractive force between masses. Um, this can be measured. You can measure this gravitational force in newtons, which is the unit of force. Um, you can do this in a, a, a number of different experiments, but most famously uh, a type of experiment called the Cavendish experiment. Now, I know that just even just saying the Cavendish experiment is triggering to a lot of flat earthers in the audience, and they're all, you know, spurging out right now in the live chat saying, oh, actually, the Cavendish experiment, don't you know, I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody on the Cavendish experiment. We That might get brought up since it is just a direct measurement of gravity in Newton's as a pseudo force. We now understand gravity to be a pseudo force, but that doesn't mean that you cannot measure it in Newton's as a force. Pseudo forces like centripetal and centrifugal forces can still be measured in Newton's as forces. So that's one way to measure gravity. That's the end of the debate, right? I, I just measured gravity. You can isolate this. You can do a Cavendish experiment that is isolated from electromagnetic forces. I'd be happy to go over one such example of that, but you can do it in a Faraday shield. You can ground it. You can discharge the surface. You can essentially eliminate electromagnetic uh, interference in this experiment, and you can just measure gravity directly. That's the end of the debate. You've measured gravity. But let's let's move on to our actual current understanding of gravity in general relativity. Um, so this is not like the end all be all. Maybe one day we will have a uh, an understanding of gravity in a, on a quantum level. But right now, general relativity is the current consensus theory for how we understand gravity. Now, this is not to say that Newtonian mechanics was wrong. It still gives us the correct answers. It's just that it's incomplete in what its understanding of gravity is. In general relativity, we understand that gravity is the curvature of space-time. So that's kind of what that picture here is illustrating in three dimensions as space-time is curved. But, you know, what does that actually mean? How do we know that space-time is curved and that is what gravity is? Well, we make testable predictions. General relativity makes predictions, we test them and we see, hey, if gravity really is from the curvature of space-time, like general relativity is saying, its predictions should be accurate. And that is indeed the case. So I'm just going to go over two quick examples. Uh, the first one is called, um, uh, it, it's called gravitational redshift. It's essentially time dilation with height in a gravitational field. So this is the paper that showed this on a really, really small scale, like just within a millimeter difference of height. So you can see here in the picture, there's that little capsule. Um, and there's different tiers in this capsule, like the rungs on a ladder that you can see. And there's atoms at these different rungs, and they tick at a at a set frequency. And if the capsule is just on its side, and they're all at the same height, all of the atoms tick at the exact same frequency. But as soon as you move that capsule to be vertical, and the different atoms are at different heights, all of a sudden the ticking is not in sync. The, the ticking is going to be a little bit different for the ones that are higher up than the ones that are a little bit below. Um, and that's because the strength of gravity is different for the ones up here versus the ones down here. And that is measurable and that is predictable. And you can use general relativity to predict exactly by how different those two ticks of those frequencies of that ticking of those atomic clocks could be. And the prediction is precisely matching with reality. General relativity tells us exactly how these two things should be different. This is literally a time dilation effect, a change in the, the passage of time. And it's di exactly predictable using general relativity if gravity really is the curvature of space-time. It tells us exactly what this should be, and we measure it and find that that is the case. The second example, so here's how we really know that it's spatial curvature, right? You could say maybe that's just a lucky guess, right? But how do we really know? Let's look at another much more impressive prediction here. So this, we're gonna be looking at LIGO. So general relativity predicts that when two massive objects like black holes or neutron stars, when they collide, a wave of space-time curvature should be emitted and travel to us at the speed of light. But here's the thing is that 
it, uh, astrophysics actually predicts that the gravitational wave should hit us first before the actual burst of light from that uh, that event. And this is just because of the dynamics of emission and absorption and everything. The gravitational wave should hit first. That is a testable prediction. First, we have to build a gravitational wave detector, though, and that took a long time. So this is what we built. It's called LIGO. It won the Nobel Prize in like 2017 or so. Basically, there's two massive arms of this experiment, and you shoot a laser, and they're at 90 degrees to each other. And you shoot, and if there's a, even a slight, a little bit of difference in the space-time, like the actual length of these two arms, they're four kilometers each. If there's even just a little bit of difference, you measure that. Um, and so you can tell, you know, if a wave of space time comes and basically things are getting a little bit longer and shorter and waving in space time, you can detect that with this equipment. Here's an actual picture of it from a helicopter. This is the one in Washington. You can see that's two four kilometer arms. That's two and a half miles. Um, and then I actually visited LIGO in Louisiana. That's me there on the right. You can see I'm at LIGO at one of the detector arms. And on the left, that's inside the control room while it is operational. So you can see that everything is lined up. The lasers are in a straight line. Um, this also just coincidentally, this LIGO also debunks flat earth because um, the construction is basically impossible to do on a flat earth. So we can talk about that some other time. I know that Ross said that this is a flat earth debate. It's not actually a flat earth debate. It's a, it's a gravity debate. We'll see if we get in that territory though. So here's the kicker. They used that LIGO ob ob observation uh, to actually detect um, a, a merger of two neutron stars. They detected that gravitational wave in both Washington and Louisiana. So they knew that that was just not just noise. They were actually detecting something real and the signal looked the same in both. And then just like they predicted, 1.7 seconds later, a completely different detector on the other side of the world saw the light that was emitted from the exact same spot in the sky. They said, look, gravitational wave, we detected it from right here in the sky. So we predict that there should have been a gamma ray burst from the same position. And what do you know, 1.7 seconds later, there was. That is the gold standard of scientific confirmation. A testable, falsifiable prediction was made and confirmed precisely. So yes, in conclusion, gravity, is real and we know this because of the numerous tested confirmed predictions of general relativity of which i only just highlighted a small subset there's gravitational waves gravitational redshift like we talked about but there's also gravitational lensing the precession of the perihelion of mercury which was predicted back in the early 20th century there's cosmological time dilation where literally the farther things are away in the sky the more slow motion they are moving Explain that one with relative density, I dare you. There's Einstein crosses like are in the picture here where you literally see the same star multiple times in the sky because the light has been lensed by gravity in a way that is impossible for traditional optics to lens that light. This cannot be explained with relative density. Um, so yeah, usually we get a different uh, uh, explanation from the flat earthers like relative density or blah, blah, blah. But there's issues with all this, mainly that they assume a direction. They assume gravity is down. They assume it's a 9.8. They can't explain where that number comes from. Um, and yeah, they just, uh, they, they beg the question from the start by assuming the direction for this. So we're going to have to get down into that fact and explain why gravity absolutely cannot be relative density and why it cannot be electromagnetism so like some other flurfers claim and why it has to be the curvature of space-time because of the wealth of testable verified predictions that have been made using general relativity so let's get into this thanks all right well thank you so much uh, grayson and also to iron horse for your introductory statements uh, let's hand it over to you there iron horse uh, to respond to some of what you just heard Okay, well, I did hear a bunch of gobbledygook. Um, starting with Cavendish, he says it's an experiment, whereas technically really all it is is an observation. Uh, when we've got something such as a torsion bar with two weights suspended, one on either end, it can, never, it can be said to never be perfectly at rest in the first place, and so it's just inevitable that it's eventually going to come to rest. You actually said that it measured something, that it measured it in newtons. Can you please describe to me how it measured this and don't just say it, tell me that it was. Tell me how... It was measured and what was measured. Okay, so it is an experiment, the Cavendish experiment. There's an independent and a dependent variable, okay? 
So the independent variable that you are altering that makes it an experiment is the distance between two masses, okay? You have two little sample test masses and you vary the distance between them. That's the independent variable. And then the dependent variable is where you measure the force that is between them as it changes with that changing distance. So there's the independent and dependent variable of your experiment. And that force is measured by the torsion balance bar, which can actually measure in Newtons whenever you apply a torsional force to the bar. That described nothing because- I the, just the answered whole your question fully. The whole idea of it is that those things are attracted to larger masses nearby, not towards one another. No, you that's know, we see... incorrect. They are attracted to each other. That's the experiment. No, it's not. It is. That, that, I'll, that'd be the I'll, I'll share my screen. I would like to show you an example of the setup for this experiment here. I so know the experiment quite well. Uh, I, I, based on what saying, you just said, it's clear that you don't. So let me share it my It would be the equivalent here. of saying if you had two large cranes next to one another suspending big steel balls, that as they got reasonably close to one another, both the balls would be attracted to one another. That is not so, the, so, the no, Cavendish here's, experiment. Here's the experiment. experiment. Here, here is the experiment. This is the Cavendish experiment. This is the smallest version of the Cavendish experiment ever done. These are masses on the size of milligrams, and they are measuring the force of attraction between these two tiny little sub like milligram masses. These two masses, these gold balls. You can see them here. This is an actual picture of this setup. So you have so the exactly ball not the two balls on the on the torsion bar being attracted towards one another, as I just told oh, no. you. Look. This ball, okay, is, is not being attracted to this ball. It's this ball right here. You can see my mouse, right? This ball yeah. is being attracted to this ball. These two are the balls that we are measuring the force between. The one yeah, that's so one of, one of them balls is on the torsion bar. Mary. Hold on, hold on. You, let me just get this out. One of the no, balls. Well, you just said that the ones on the torsion bar were attracted to one another. So you no, completely. That, okay. If that was what you understood of what I was saying, I apologize for miscommunicating. That is not what I was saying. Let me explain what I was saying. The apology the accepted. I'm trying to explain it, Iron Horse here. The, 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 this ball right here. We are measuring the attractive force between this one, MT, and MS for this ball over here. Are we on the same page now? Well, that's what I said from the start. That's what I'm asking you about. What force are you measuring and how are you measuring it? That's what I've just been answering. So we're measuring the attractive force between these two masses here, and we are measuring it based on right here. You see that there's a, a little center of this, this bar right here. You're measuring the amount of torsional force detected right here. That okay, is what an independent variable. What instrument measures that force? That's what I'm asking. That was my question. The torsion balance. This little string right here is a measure of torsion that you can measure the torsional force. Or you can also, right here, what That's they've done, like a a photo, they, they, they measured it in two ways. Okay, let me explain. They used a photo diode right here that bounces off a little mirror, and you can measure the amount of deflection which then you can calculate what is the amount of force that is being felt by this torsional bar. There's two different ways to determine it. How does that measure a force? It's literally the instrument and you get a number back that gives you a force recorded in Newtons. This is a fact. Look, here's their data right here. Like They're measuring the displacement of the bar right here, the displacement as measured by this photodiode, versus the frequency of moving, they're moving this back and forth, this first mass back and forth, that's the independent variable, and they're measuring the amount of force right here. You can see the force is right here marked on their uh, actual graph here, their data. They're getting a force in Newtons as the X, like as the dependent variable. This is the experiment. Okay, so I understand how a scale works. You know, it's sort of like a, a resistance measurement force so you know when it's got no weight on it it measures at zero so it's grounded so you put a weight on it uh, we can physically measure a weight what instrument are they using to physically measure this force again they're measuring the calculation with the photodiode and then using physics to calculate what force is being felt by that torsion bar you yeah it's okay using this. physics but what is the instrument please one more time. What is the a instrument they're using diode to measure that? is one instrument and the second That's a light is the torsion wire have you ever have you ever experimented have you ever used a torsion wire iron horse a torsion wire sounds to me just like a plumb bob it just measures no, the it, universe up and down perpendicular force to the surface of the ground you can use a torsion wire to measure the amount of torsion in newtons as a force like i'm sorry that you don't have experience with torsion wires and photodiodes but i it's not my responsibility the whole that point of the cavendish the experiment here. the whole point of the cavendish experiment is that it's perfectly balanced hence it's a torsion bar with a weight on either end <clears throat> what exactly are you measuring 
And how are you I'm doing it? Explain it. Oh, okay, literally, you're, you're not explaining anything. Entirely. You said a photo diode. That's like a camera uses. Yeah, you know, you're measuring Look, light. You start. You start in a balanced state, right, where the the forces are balanced, and then you introduce another mass, which then has an attractive force with one of the ends of that bar, and you are measuring the amount of torsion that is introduced to that bar. That is what you are measuring. The torsional force. Can you get but that? You're through still not explaining how it is being measured. I've, I've gone over it multiple times now. What 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 do you want from me? I've explained well, to you. You're how they've it. it. You're just saying global well, physics does it and uh, light does it. You know, like you, you, you've mentioned nothing. Like, do you want to read through this paper? I can send you the link where they go through their entire methodology, and you can go to your heart's content, and you can get all the answers, all the questions answered that you want. Well, the you're the one explaining it. I just I just want a simple YouTube. layman's terms. What device are you using to measure this force? And you can't a give me one. Original wire about... and a photo diode laser. I, I, I'm a so so diode laser. Okay. All right. Well, you don't are you know not, that. Are you not picking up? Like, uh, do you uh, do you doubt this experiment? Are you saying that this experiment is a hoax or it's not real or what? Well, absolutely, I am actually because if the Earth's mass is so in incredibly strong, then such such a tiny ball would be insignificant compared to the Earth's downward force. That you'd need something, you know, ten times size of an elephant to create the slightest little effect no, against no. Earth. Do you understand how you add up force vectors? Like this is high school physics. Uh, add up force vectors. Yes. Something so tiny compared to something so massive yeah. creates yeah. a greater force. No, and, yeah. and it's measurable. Okay. Yes, there, there's nothing There's nothing against this other than your own personal incredulity. There's no physics against this. You are literally, if you did a force, like a free body diagram of this situation and you drew each force that was affecting this, bat, this mass, you would account for the Earth's gravitational attraction to it on both of them with a direction going down and then you have a tiny little arrow going sideways and that's what you're measuring with the torsion you know why mm -hmm. because the force of gravity is perpendicular to the direction of torsion so it's not affected okay and it's also well known that uh, the cavendish experiment doesn't always work um we also know that you've uh, have to invent something like 95 percent dark matter to explain why the universe doesn't provide Changing the subject. Come on. Into now. a singularity. All right, let's well, of course. Just, moving on. We're still let's let him finish his thought and you can uh, address after there. Just uh, let's give him some space. Go ahead, Ross. Yeah, it's also well known that you have to introduce 95% dark matter for, to prevent the entire universe colliding into a singularity. You have to have dark energy to stop it from spreading apart. Um, you've got everything except uh, visible proof of gravity. You've nothing but theoretical garb in order to make your theory of attraction. Uh, even possible. Uh, as you know, Tesla even said, there is this invisible force which everything in the universe operates by, which we can also see in things like pendulums, which change via latitude. We can see it in the star rotation themselves as the stars get further from planets, they move in larger and larger circles. So there is this invisible energetic force constantly surrounding us that everything responds to. And it's just as likely that the Cavendish experiment is reacting to something like that as well like just some sort of invisible force which it is not gravity it is not an attraction of mass okay so you're done there you brought up a whole lot i don't know even why you brought up dark matter because your ultimate point didn't even have anything to do with it but okay um i don't see how dark matter is relevant and you got dark energy and dark matter confused in their roles in cosmology anyway but that's fine you just got them flipped but um yeah the Evidence supporting the existence of dark matter is like coming from multiple independent sources that all corroborate and give the same exact value. At least six or seven different independent sources of methodologies to support dark matter. You have a couple for, for dark energy as well. Like th this is not just one observation that's telling us that these things actually do exist despite us not knowing like exactly what they are. We know that they exist from their actual evidence from gravitational lensing, Grav galaxies rotating like bullet cluster i just feel like this is just so off topic to even bring up well when it's absolutely the topic because if you didn't make up gravity in the first place you wouldn't need to make up invisible dark forces that you can't even see or detect but you know must be there so obviously gravity is wrong to begin with and we can scrap the whole idea and start with something which actually works well, let me let me clarify because i actually that is incorrect even if we scrapped gravity if we completely got rid of the entire idea of gravity we would still have dark matter like we wouldn't just get rid of dark matter by doing that we would still not have an explanation that needs dark matter to solve based on our observation 
Please explain why. Oh, you assume everything in the universe is actually physical matter or something, something equivalent to what the Earth is made from. Whereas, as far as I'm concerned, Earth is the only physical plane in all of existence, and all the lights in the sky are not terra firma whatsoever. So we don't need gravity to explain why and how they exist. They exist in a different form of medium altogether once we leave beyond the firmament, which is above us, and they are in a different sort of medium and obey completely different rules. What we see and experience here in the physical plane is what we see and experience. And so we don't have to try and explain the entire universe when all we're really trying to describe is what is here and now, what is beneath our feet, what is in front of our faces, how all the laws of physics behave according to observations as opposed to hypothetical things about things that happen beyond the curve where we can't see them out of sight, out of mind, beyond this curve, which we've yes. never seen. I was we trying to let you finish, but you never seem to finish. But okay, it is actual okay. observations that you need to explain. You can't just say, well, we don't need to explain actual observations of the universe because like we're only concerned with what's happening here. Again, like you were the one that brought up dark matter. And now when I bring up observations that you need dark matter to explain, all of a sudden, oh, I don't care about those observations. We only want to talk about what's here on Earth. And now it's a flat Earth debate. Okay, I thought you wanted to talk about dark matter. So let's talk about one observation that you can't explain. The bullet cluster. Are you familiar with it? I'm not familiar with the bullet cluster. Okay, so it's one observation that cannot be explained by any theory of electromagnetism or any theory of modified gravity. You need dark matter to explain the behaviors of the bullet cluster. What happened is these two galaxies, like literally were on a collision and the actual movement that they had when they were colliding okay it cannot be explained with electromagnetism with relative density with some sort of ether you, you can't explain the way that it's moved except for if there's an invisible dark matter component which you can actually literally see where its density distribution would have to be in order to get this this sort of movement because it, what it looks like is happening is that these two galaxies are moving around nothing it looks like there's some invisible thing that these galaxies are moving around and feeling a force from. But if you don't have dark matter, you, you, there's no explanation for it. Okay, well, that's a cool story, bro, because um, I wasn't talking about other galaxies and so forth. I mean, even our nearest star, according to you know, heliocentrism, is you know, some multiple light years away. So obviously these galaxies, each of them would still have you know, spaces unfathomable between one another. So anyway, you're hopping off completely as far as I'm concerned. Okay, no, don't topic, accuse me of doing that. You were the one that brought up dark matter. And this is one yeah. of the pillars of evidence supporting dark matter. You were the one that said, without gravity, we don't need dark matter. I am bringing this up as an example to clearly show that even without gravity, you cannot explain the behavior of the bullet cluster, which requires dark matter. This is a no, direct you're... refutation of your point. You brought this up, not me. Yeah, but you're making the assumption that these galaxies are physical matter in the first place and that they we behave in the same sort of laws as to which we observe here on Earth, where you assume that we have gravity and then you have to assume dark matter to stop everything else behaving because you've already assumed that they're physical stuff in the first place. Where I say oh. there's no such thing as anything physical outside of the realm upon which we live. Okay, and so I once you remove that assumption, then all of your pseudoscience is no longer necessary or okay, required. It's not an assumption. This is just is. a fact based on observations from like spectroscopy, for example. We can look no. at what elemental composition these distant objects have by their spectroscopy. No, that's not that, that's not true whatsoever. We can say that the spectroscopy is entirely due to the atmospheric gases and the way these things stimulate it to create light visible to our eyes. So all of this could be only happening because of our observations from here on Earth looking through our atmosphere. And oh. once we're above the atmosphere, as we see in high altitude balloon footage, there are no stars visible whatsoever. All we see is the one giant big sun and we see a tiny dot which represents the moon. And that is all that is visible from above a certain height. So we know so the importance of our atmosphere is the real giver of light and okay. all of spectroscopy happens as we see through our atmosphere okay. and the various gases that you are made accumulated by multiple times. these objects. You made the same okay. point multiple times. Let me respond. Well, that's are right. It's familiar, important. Are you familiar with the fact that we have observatories above the atmosphere, like the James Webb Space Telescope, that do spectroscopy without having any atmosphere inter intervening? Right? There's no I believe they only use waves. radio waves. They use radio waves only and they don't use spectroscopy whatsoever. They literally do spectroscopy, yes. Everyone can look that up and see that the James Webb Telescope does spectroscopy, yes. 
Yes, and NASA hires really good artists to try and turn them into pretty pictures, which yeah, are all men. It's all a conspiracy. It's all a hoax. But you know How what? About it's a not conspiracy. It's proven. We've seen interviews of the artists themselves who admit that that's what they do. That's their job. That's not a conspiracy. This is an observable fact. Anybody okay, can search. Okay, Ross, them. I challenge you. I challenge you in front of everybody. Find me one example of an artist saying that they created a spectrograph. A spectrograph. Yes, I, the actual spectroscopic layout showing the elemental composition of a distant galaxy or star. I want you to find an artist admitting to making that up. Find it for me. Look, I call it's hardly the time and place in the middle of a debate for me to start researching oh, stuff. Oh, okay, okay, you, okay, I got you. Because this you is can't. something we've because all seen just, before. Anybody who does their research has seen this before. There's plenty oh, of interviews of, of NASA I challenge everybody in all it. the comments, everybody on YouTube listening to this, try to find an example of an artist admitting that they made up a spectrograph you can't find it i didn't say they made up the spectrograph itself i'm just saying that they make up all the pretty pictures that we've seen every well, single last about a pretty picture i'm talking about actual data a spectrograph which shows the elemental composition of distant stellar objects look the spectrograph can be absolutely perfectly correct i'm not arguing that i'm just saying that there are all pretty that. pictures made by artists and maybe you they're are using in fact the arguing that, Ross, because you're saying because you're saying that we don't know that these distant objects are material. But if you're saying that the spectrographs are accurate, then we know beyond a shadow of any doubt that they are in fact physical because we can tell what atoms they're made up from the spectrograph. No, you can't. You can just yes, tell what colors they produce in our sky visible to us through our atmosphere. We can Simple literally that. see the emission spectrum corresponding to the exact elemental composition. Okay, so obviously, yep, you're personally invested in this. Um, we've seen that because you visited the place. You not. said, and you even said that this thing that's called a, yeah, you know, phonetically called a go lie, even though we call it a lie go. Um, you said that it's impossible to build on a flat Earth. How is it impossible to build something two and a half miles long or four kilometers in a perfectly straight line on a flat Earth when that would be the most ideal location to do it on? Because it's not level. It's actually curved. And if it was on a flat Earth, it would have to be perfectly level and flat. But in reality, they had to compensate for the curve of the Earth by actually raising up one end and having the whole thing slightly off level. In fact, if you and take you a level... Wait, wait. One, I let you finish here. If, if you take a level and you were to put a level on top of that tube at LIGO, only one part around the midway would be flat and like perfectly level and then you go off to the side it's no longer level and then when you go off to the other side it's no longer level but it's perfectly straight it is so straight that level would not suffice and they could not make it level they had to make it straight and do you do have evidence of this i presume yes absolutely i can share my screen and i can show you the actual engineering documents that for the actual company that created the arms of ligo and they had to figure out how to make it straight and they specifically say that level is not straight enough for their purposes okay right, if you want to Let share me... it you can go ahead i have it ready okay oh wait uh this is the wrong lego paper let me share sorry it's kind of hard to find where i've got all these papers here we go I think this is, should be yeah, it. Science yeah. gets tricky, doesn't it? All right. So this is the precision alignment of LIGO four kilometer arms using dual frequency differential GPS. Here's like the the engineers, of the company where they did it. They explain their entire like process here. You can read how they got this so straight that it couldn't be level. It's all documented here. Everybody can see the title, the authors. Go look it up yourself and read this document. And this single document makes flat Earth impossible. Okay, right. and so have All you right. have you ever heard of the thing called the Tamarack Mine Mysteries, where in actual fact these geodetic scientists back in around the 1900s uh, went out in the field and tried to, to physically measure the circumference of the Earth, and they wanted a better uh, example than the Eratosthenes experiment where they just measured shadows of the sun, whereas, you know, because as we know, if you measure shadows of the sun with a nearby local sun, all that Eratosthenes really measured was actually the path of the sun, which just so happens to be the equator. So you get Ross, exactly Ross, hold on. Is this, is this on topic for gravity or are you talking about yeah. flat Earth stuff now? This is on topic for gravity. Are you so, sure this is about say, gravity? Because it sounds like flat Earth. Just, well, just let me speak and you'll see where I'm going with this, okay? Sounds like flat Earth. Okay, good, good. Just button it, thank you. So as, as we were saying, the best way to measure the circumference of the Earth 
would be to use gravity to, to suspend long plumb bobs down towards the center because everything is attracted towards the center according to the laws of your gravity. And it's, you know, it's, it's more practical than just, uh, erecting mile high poles, measuring the distance at the top and measuring the distance at the bottom. What they did is they suspended long plumb bobs down deep mine shafts in order to measure the distance at the top compared to the distance at the bottom, which would be less, and therefore they could use a formula to determine a more accurate circumference for the you know, circumference of the Earth. But what they found in every example is that the plumb bobs actually got further apart towards the bottom. And in fact, when they finally selected two mine shafts a mile apart at the surface, at a mile depth, joined by a horizontal shaft at the bottom, they were one mile eight inches apart at the bottom, which is the exact opposite of expectations of global Earth measurements. So you are saying that they are using gravity to measure the levelness of this go uh, system that you're talking about. And yet real science found that using gravity to measure level goes the opposite direction of expectations. How do you explain that? Okay, so one, um, LIGO is real science. I mean, they're doing real science there. They are measuring gravitational waves. That is real science 100%. Uh, two, um, could you repeat the name of this? Because I haven't heard of this mineshaft experiment with plumb bobs, and I would like to look more into it, but obviously without being familiar with the actual uh, material, I won't be able to have, be able okay, to write well, in on it. So I'd like to look it up for a later point. So remind me the name of this so I can just jot it down. Okay, you, you'll probably have to go to a library to, to find most just, information. Just tell me what the name of it is called. Because looking online will give you very little. It's called Tamarack, T-A-M-A-R-A-C-K, Mine Mysteries. That's the general thing if you search that. You'll find a little bit of information about you know, the guy who reported on it in one of the scientific journals. The Tamarack Mine Mysteries is quite well known. I first read about it in a book, which is actually called Secret of the Ages, which is talking about a hollow earth. And this guy was proposing that we live on the outside surface of a hollow earth. But really, after you follow that experiment, you have to presume um, if we're living on the inside, as the concave earth is like to say, that makes far more sense, where gravity could be explained by the rotation of it, which is what NASA often proposes for a spaceship designed to artificially stim simulate gravity in space, would be to have it spinning. So that if we're on the inside surface, uh, rotating fast enough, that could actually explain how gravity even works. It's like a centripetal force. Um, water would still seek and find its level. The atmosphere would still move with us. Planes flying high would fly shorter distances. So if we lived on the inside of the Earth, it makes far more sense than living on the outside, hurtling through a vacuum of space where gravity is a necessary requirement to make it possible that people could live on the, you know, the outside surface, either on the sides, the bottom, the top. Everybody's on top in all, all right. directions. We'll have to pass okay, that, on here, so. that is what gravity been going is for a while, for Ross. in the first place. Yeah, yes, I mean, but I'm just saying that is why you've invented well, gravity. I know you're just saying. You've positive. been just saying for a while. Let me get in on this. Yeah. Okay, so like I will look into this Tamarack mining mystery. To me, immediately off the bat, it's very suspicious that there's not much information about it online. I'm suspicious about where you learned it from, but immediately when I look it up, it looks like some kind of thing from the early 1900s that hasn't been reproduced since. So my question right. for you, my question for you, because, you know, all kinds of things could cause these results from like literally just like air fluctuations in the tubes. So I want to know, right, have we verified these results by repeating them in the preceding 100 years since? Have any flat earthers done an experiment of this and repeated the results of the initial Tamarack measurements. Okay, so we're talking about something you know, in an era where men were men. You know, to go a mile depth down a mine shaft is no mean feat in the first place. This is some serious sort of science where men got their hands dirty. Uh, it's the sort of thing they did repeat many times. They sent their results off to the French and asked them to repeat it. And they eventually found that it was so conflicting with everything that they thought they believed that they basically swept it under the rug and promptly forgot all about no it. Conspiracy. That's basically how science does it. When they get something wrong that goes against all beliefs, they just ignore it and say, well, no, yeah, that's let's not pretend how that, that never happened. You, you want me to give you multiple examples just from within the last like two years that science has gotten surprised and, and something has gone against a scientific paradigm and we've had to change and not just cover it up and sweep it under the rug? Like, like that the happens flat multiple times, all the time in science. It's very common and it's very exciting because it's how scientists make their careers. Like the scientists who discovered, like if this is what you're saying is accurate with these mine shafts, a scientist who discovered this and documented it and verified it would like 
be famous. They would make their entire career. They'd be incentivized to do this. But you're just saying, oh, they're covering it up. They could repeat it, but they don't want to. They want to hide the truth. Okay, it's just going to call fall back into conspiracy. So let's just get the back on uh, track. Look, that's how you dismiss everything. Just call it a conspiracy. It's so easy for you to just you're call it a conspiracy. You're dismissing everything. You're saying that no, no, okay, all the evidence reality. I brought forward, it's a conspiracy. And the evidence that you brought forward, it's being hidden because it's another conspiracy. Everything is a conspiracy in a hand way for you. No, no. I think you hit the nail on the head when you say these men make a career out of it. You have to make, to make a career, you have to have somebody who's willing to pay you to do something. And if you don't give them the results they want, well, you're not going to get paid. You're going to get dumped and you're going to get thought of as a crackpot theorist. And that's why flat earthers do not have a career in science because we question the science. We question all of the nonsense that you guys bring up, whereas you guys have to keep on whacking each other on the back and getting peer support from one another. You can't do anything new in science without being shunned. And if somebody did prove the Tamarack mine mysteries, they would get kicked out of science. They they wouldn't. So here's the thing, though. Here's the thing is is, is (laughs) that like, you are getting paid to get like develop scientific progress, get attention and and prestige for your institution. And what's a good way of doing that? Oh, making a scientific discovery that changes the paradigm and 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 challenges the consensus and and makes us change the consensus because you brought the evidence to back your claim and overturn the consensus. That's why flat earthers cannot get their scientific careers off the ground because they cannot provide the evidence that demonstrates their claims. They can claim a lot of stuff, but then when it comes to actually providing evidence, that's why it's not science because they can't. And we could talk about this with the relative density stuff because Ross is making a claim about what gravity actually is. He says it's caused by relative density. So let's talk about that and why that is impossible. Yeah, well, that's why young flat earthers are not out to make a scientific career on it because they know that nobody's going to be paying them to tell them to give them information that proves that they are wrong. That there's no force of attraction. That the only force is resistance, and resistance comes from density. Therefore, relative density is the true explanation for how things either float, sink, or or uh, rise. That's all okay, that is so let's, required. Let's pop that, let's pop that balloon. Let's 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 explain why it cannot in any way, shape, or form be relative density, right? So okay, you have a column, right? And the column has different levels um with different like mediums that have different densities in them, right? Like oil or water or whatever. You have a column of so in the liquid that has form, different yeah. layers, right? Okay. So then if you put an object to it, it'll go to, you know, sort by its relative density, whatever. The thing is, is that Ross needs to under explain why there's a directionality in this column to begin with. Why is it that the more dense stuff is on the bottom and the less dense stuff is on top? And why is it that you can actually go into like like an airplane, right? You can have like those little free falling airplanes where where you're in the airplane, all of a sudden you're experiencing basically zero gravity because you're in free fall, right? And you kind of simulate it like, oh, it's interesting and cool. So if if you took this column and took it to the zero gravity weight, right? And then you introduce an object in between that that den- that density there. What's going to happen? Is the is the object going to be sorted by the relative density? No, it's not. Right. And why? Because you're uh, in zero gravity. All right, let's hand the ball There's back no over fact- there. There's definitely no such thing as zero gravity. Even the ISS is apparently 95% Earth's gravity, and they say it's 250 miles high. So that's um, clearly false. Um, basically, false. everything. Everything is resistance. And if you think of acoustics, for example, is a good way of, of, of thinking of it. If sound, we say that the higher sound is always the lighter tone. The deeper sound is the more bass things. Everything in physics requires a base. The base is the form of resistance from everything starts. So the density tower itself has a base and then has solid walls. And everything finds its place when it's at rest. Once it's at rest, that's where we get the word resistance from. So everything that once it's at rest has resistance to one thing to another. When everything is in free fall, which is what you falsely call is zero G, it's actually everything is just in free fall in an enclosed capsule creating the simulation of zero gravity because everything's falling at the same time at once. Well, everything is just free to drop at the same rate. It's the, the rate of drop is not determined by the density of the object. Otherwise, heavier objects would always fall faster than the others. But everything is falling at exactly the same time. Once it comes to rest, then the things will form themselves according to their relative density and give us the density tower that so, we see. You need so, resistance and at rest from the base of the tower. So I don't 
think that you've fully understood that you've just gotten got here with this example. So really, I, I want you to like actually visualize what we're talking about right here. Like the column, you, it seems like you got the column. It's got the different levels of different density. And you've got a really heavy little lead ball. And you drop it just in a normal room, right? And that lead ball goes through all those different layers of density, right? And, and it goes all the way to the bottom. And then when you go up to an airplane, you don't like when I say zero G, I don't care. I'll just say free fall, right? Because you under, you understand when you're in free fall, then you're all of a sudden you're not like everything around you is not falling like you're in the room anymore. If you were to introduce that lead ball in that airplane in free fall, it would not fall through those different layers of relative density, even though the same densities are still in the same layers as before. There's no change in any of the relative densities. You, the, all the same relative densities well, are in the, all the same up. order. They're in the same order in the column. You all have right. not changed anything about the relative densities. Let's let Ross jump. The only thing that you've changed are in free fall. And when you drop the ball, it doesn't fall. Why not? That is absolutely not a gotcha. That is completely false because I'd already described that because everything is in free fall at the same time. And we know that there's a universal rate of drop of the 9.8 meters per second squared. That is just the rate of drop as we observe it. And everything, in fact, inside the density tower will actually start to reverse given sufficient amount of time in dropping. Um, the base will end up becoming the top and the things will reverse form. And so the lead ball should stay at the top. Everything is falling at the same rate. It's only when it comes to rest and stops that the form of resistance comes from the base once again, and then they will reverse back into the normal structure. So you you got no gotcha on me whatsoever. Oh, you're, not you're, understanding you yourself from. you're not understanding the gotcha here, right? Because you are saying no. that what is causing the motion, this downward acceleration that I'm calling gravity, you're saying you are saying that what is causing that is the differences in relative density of the medium to the object. But in free fall, in this density column, you have not changed anything about any of the relationships for any of the densities of any objects involved or the mediums. The density relationships are all the exact same. And that's what you're saying is causing this downward acceleration. But all of a sudden, we haven't changed anything about the densities. The, accel the downward acceleration is gone. So therefore, we that's know that that downward acceleration cannot have been caused by the relative densities. That's why you're wrong. I don't say that anything is causing a downward acceleration. I'm saying that the uh, downward acceleration is allowed to permit because of the lack of resistance. And that's the lack of resistance from the density of air. That's why even a vacuum, it's the perfect lack of resistance and everything will drop at exactly the same rate. But when everything is in free fall motion inside the enclosed aeroplane, everything is in free fall there is no acceleration of one thing greater than another. Everything falls at exactly the same rate. So there's no, no reason for the lead ball to accelerate greater than the other things falling at the same speed, is it? Okay. So then the reason why the cause for this downward acceleration, I'm glad you agree, is not relative density. So then relative density cannot explain gravity. So then what explains- No, you're calling it attraction of bigoty. Whereas so I'm saying what it is relative explains, density. Ross, let me, get, let me ask a question. What is it that causes- this downward acceleration the density of air the medium that it's in everything is in that medium of air and everything being more dense than air drops at the same rate so but as, there we already went, we, as we already described right in the free fall experiment you can change those densities as in an, an actual experiment you change the independent variable of the density and you're saying the density is what's causing the downward acceleration so you change the independent variable and you get no change on the dependent variable. You don't get any change in the downward acceleration, so they're not causative. So your hypothesis has been refuted. That's that's rubbish. We're still in the medium of air, are we not? You can, it doesn't matter. Well, you're in the medium of the density column and you're introducing a, a heavy lead ball into the middle of this density column and you're figuring out which way it goes. And yeah, but the column is when dropping. They're in free fall, wait, wait, in the, when they're in free fall, all of those relative densities are in the exact same orientation as before. Nothing has changed about any of the relative densities. So therefore, nothing should be different about the downward acceleration if your hypothesis is true. But when you're in free fall, there is no downward acceleration. It's completely gone. So your hypothesis is false. That's right. Everything is in the same accelerative field, the same yeah, relative to each other, right? But that, that's the thing is that you're saying that, rel that it's the relative density that's causing these downward accelerations. But we haven't changed yeah. anything about the downward acceleration. We haven't changed anything about the densities. And the acceleration is changing. Why? Acceleration is not changing. When you're in, when you when you're in free fall, right? When you're in the airplane, 
I'm talking about the the acceleration of the lead ball relative to the acceleration of the the density column. That's what I'm talking. Yeah, about. they're all dropping. They're all dropping at the same rate. So then, the exactly. So then, their acceleration relative to each other is zero, Ross. Correct. Yes, that's, that's right. What I'm saying that's what I'm saying. So we are agreeing, agreeing now but, but that you have not changed anything about the densities, and yet your you're shooting yourself in relative the foot. to each other is zero. You're shooting yourself in the foot because I'm saying that relative density only happens when a thing is at rest. Once you bring the thing to rest, once it stops on the ground and you put your density tower on the ground, it is at rest, and then everything will sort itself in accordance to its own okay, relative but, uh, density. That doesn't work because if you throw a ball up in it the air, work. right? It's not at rest, but gravity still works to bring it back down to the ground. So we know it's gravity still doesn't be more, work when you're at rest. It's still more dense than than the medium of air. Oh, you're, you're, come on, you're falling air, apart, man. Density air does not explain give why it the is ball downward buoyancy. acceleration. Air does not give the ball buoyancy. That is why it falls through it. It does not resist it. The ground is more dense enough to resist it. Water is dense enough to resist it. That will give it buoyancy. Why yeah, would you, you expect air to give it rest. buoyancy? The ball is not at rest, and yet it's still being affected by gravity. Yeah, but the thing stays at rest, will remain at rest unless another force acts upon it. So until you threw it in the air, it would stay at rest, and it would but stay on the ground. But you're saying that the other force is coming from differences in relative density, and that's creating a force that we call gravity. But I'm showing you that cannot be the case because you can literally have two differences in relative density, introduce an object into them, and it doesn't move towards the least dense medium if you're in free fall. That refutes the idea that this could be caused by differences in relative density. It cannot Why explain would it? That. Why would it when it's in free fall? Everything is in free fall okay, together. Look, I'm trying to make this very simple. We can move on because um, I don't think that you're going to get this. I'm going to try one more time to explain this simply, okay? There's two yeah, examples, right? You have a lead ball being introduced into the middle of two different mediums. One's a less dense medium, one's a more dense medium, right? And you're saying that it should go towards like the its relative densities. It should fall down towards the least dense medium. Right, because the lead ball is more dense than the medium around it, and that's what's it causing the downward that downward acceleration. Right. Is the differences yeah. in the difference in the, is the differences in density between the lead ball and the medium around it? Right, you're saying that's what's making that lead ball because it's 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 not being supported, so it's just going to go down. Right, but when you're in free fall, when all of those density relationships are exactly the same, you haven't changed anything about the densities and how they are relative to each other. But now that lead ball just stays there. It doesn't move. Actually, it just stays there. Actually, Why? if anything, I would say it would rise to the top of the tower in it appearance. Doesn't. It doesn't, though. That doesn't? Because, you know why? Because it that does. movement, that pseudo force that's being applied to it, is not because of relative densities. That's the reason. Is it relative density? As I keep explaining it to you, you seem a bit too thick to understand this can only occur once the thing has come at rest. When a thing is in free fall, everything is in free fall at the exact same rate. And you've also removed the air resistance factor doing it inside an aeroplane because all the air is also dropping with everything else at so, the same time. Look, Whereas if you if did you it in the open that, air, you would get more air resistance. If so, you admit that, which you just admitted, then you are admitting that relative densities cannot be the explanatory factor because you're saying that the differences in relative densities don't affect anything until the entire system, both the medium and the object, are at rest, right? Correct. But when both of them are in movement, you can still have gravitational forces acting and you can still measure those gravitational forces. So this is how we know that density cannot be the explanation. It's literally ruled out, Ross. Now, you're, you're just making stuff up now. You can't measure anything in free fall. A scale doesn't work in free fall. There's no gravity in free fall. Everything is just dropping at the same rate. A scale only works once it's at rest and sitting on the base of something that gives it resistance. If you try to put a scale in the bottom of a swimming pool, for example, then the density of the medium will prevent a person giving a true weight. But the mass of the person themselves hasn't changed whatsoever. It is the you, medium you which is do, giving them weight. You can do the Cavendish experiment in free fall and still measure an attractive force. Yeah, I'm not mass. talking about the Cavendish experiment. No, but just, I'm uh, explaining to you that you can measure... We're talking these about relative density. Fall. Okay. And it's the density of the medium that this determines. Like, I didn't quite get to finish my um, introduction. If, um, if I might be allowed a second just to describe one part... I don't... It's the open discussion period. It's no longer a presentation. Yeah, but um, it, it's relevant to this. Um, I'm just going to talk about the basketball. 
um, a rubber bladder contained within an even harder outer surface that holds a more or less perfectly spherical shape. In the medium of air, an inflated basketball readily falls back to Earth no matter how high we throw it. The compressed air within it adds to its mass along with the outer shell, and this not only gives it great buoyancy, but also great bouncing effects upon the solid base beneath the feet of every one of us. If we throw it at the ground hard enough, it will bounce high into the air, yet it always returns as air is insufficiently dense enough to give it buoyancy. Throw it into a swimming pool, however, and it readily floats. It takes great perseverance and possibly even assistance to drag one to the bottom of a deep swimming pool, whereupon being released, it shoots with great vehemency towards the surface, oh, shoots into on. the air before returning and finding a place of resistance on the surface displacing its own weight in water according to the Archimedes principle. So the basketball, when we drag it to the bottom of a pool, will shoot up yes, anti-gravity. Obviously. obviously. Why are you filibustering the stuff we agree about? Because it's obviously not gravity. Gravity gets turned off at the bottom of a swimming pool where all that water on top of the ball should be put, holding it down do even more. So. Do you know the formula to calculate density or buoyancy, Ross? Do you know the formula? Well, as I said, the Archimedes principle, it's the displacement of its own weight determines whether it floats or not. And you know that there is a G in the formula for gravity. A downward force, a downward acceleration no, is already accounted force, for in buoyancy. That's not a downward force whatsoever. That's just 9.8 meters. It literally is, meters. man. It's a downward that's, vector with units of it's acceleration. 9.8 it's 9.8 meters per second. It's 9.8 meters per second squared. And because the thing is floating, it is not accelerating whatsoever. So it becomes zero. And if you multiply anything by zero, no, you, you get you, zero. You're not you're, so your you're formula accounting is for G. You're not saying that this You're actually not. is moving at 9.8 meters per second. You just have to account for that acceleration in order to properly account for the actual value of its buoyant force. This you have to man account for 9.8 downward acceleration. But there is no acceleration. So therefore, yeah, well, you, you make have it to zero. Calculate. That's the thing. I, I know you're saying that there is none, but it must be accounted for in order to get an actual accurate uh, uh, calculation of what the buoyancy how, is. How is an object at rest accelerating downwards? Because it's in gravitational field. That's how gravity works, Ross. This is the basics. This is the very basics how, of the basics. How is something at rest accelerating? Okay. It's literally everything in a gravitational field. This is the basics of, of how gravity works. Everything in that gravitational field is experiencing that downward acceleration vector all the time. No matter what, it's actual movement or not. You can have the forces that are balancing out so that it, overall the forces balance and it's say, not moving. Did you say whether it's moving or not? Yes, because again, okay. this is back to the so base it's not accelerating. of a three body diagram. I don't. I'm. I really don't know if you understand how to add up vectors when you're adding up like the forces that are acting on. I'm an just object. talking about the basketball floating in water. Yeah, you know, this is one body yes. in a body of in a yes. medium of water, and yes. so when it's at rest, it's accelerating. Yes. There are two forces that, acting that is upon the most it. scientific thing. You I've gotta ever let heard me finish the sentence here, Ross. In order to figure out what forces are acting and what accelerations are acting on that basketball, which overall has a net acceleration of zero, you must ah. add up. You must add up all the different force vectors on it, including from gravity and the buoyant force that cancel each other out and yield overall zero. But that G, that downward acceleration, is still something that must be put into your formulas to calculate an accurate value for its buoyancy. You have to account for it. it. You can't just ignore it and say it's not happening. It doesn't exist. You have to account for it to get the right answer. Okay, so why is the basketball more buoyant in salt water than it is in fresh water? How, how does the formula work for that? Be, you, because you have to account for the relative densities when buoyancy. Oh, relative density? Yes. Ah, oh, thank you. You mean if we look up what specific gravity means, we'll say relative density. That's exactly right. Thank you very nope. much. The debate I really is don't think that you're, you're, you're wrapping your head relative around density what's happening here, Look, relative density is not something that just you can just throw away and ignore entirely. Okay, it's just not the it cause of the gravity. Hey, <laughs> okay, Ross, come on, man. It's just something that is not the cause of gravity. It's not like you can just ignore it in order to calculate the actual dynamics for how objects move especially when you're talking about buoyancies and, and, and in mediums, you do have to account for these things, but it's not, that's not where you're getting the direction and acceleration of motion from alone. You have to use gravity in order to get the right value. And this is high school level physics. I mean, he, he, he should know this. Okay. So then why does a feather fall at the same rate as a bowling ball inside of a vacuum? Because they're both 
in the Earth's gravitational field, which is warping and curving the space around them. So they both will be experiencing the same curvature of space-time, a.k.a. Mm -hmm. the same gravity, so they will have the same acceleration downward. And yet if we drop space them... Space-time around them that's being affected. And yet if we drop them in the medium of air, they fall at different rates. Because of air resistance. I mean, come uh, on, that's so obvious. So resistance is a force. Yeah, no, no, duh. You obviously have air resistance that's slowing you down and changing your acceleration. Nobody's going to argue okay. against that. Okay, gotcha. Well, see, my argument is that resistance is the force, the only force. Well, it's Attraction wrong, is man. not necessary. Attraction is not necessary. It's not required. All that is required is a force of resistance to prevent something from falling, that something will fall indefinitely until a force of resistance prevents it from dropping. So and then how do you explain the actual measured force of the attraction? At the bottom of the known universe. Thank so you. I was nearly finished my sentence. So then how do you explain the actual measurement of a force of attraction in Newton is, between no, masses in the Cavendish experiment? All right, let's give Ross some there space is, to answer there. No force of attraction is all I'm saying. There's a force of resistance. There's no force of attraction apart from things like magnetic and electrostatics and so forth. But there's no necessary force of attraction in order to have our universal and observable up and down, which is all described by relative density. Well, so then how do you explain, um, I showed you the experiment here, like I, I literally just showed it to you, where it was showing you just for your eyes, the measurement of an attractive force. Are you just going to look at the evidence as I'm presenting it to you and just say, no, -uh, it doesn't exist. I don't see anything, even though when your eyes are showing you. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. OK, so then it's just sticking your head in the sand and denying reality. No, not really. So are you going to address any of the things that I brought up in my introduction now, since we've pretty much worked all yours to death? And are you going to OK. Ross, no, this is so explain, aggravating no, because no, we no, haven't actually talked about what I brought up in my in my presentation. I talked about gravitational it's been all redshift. you. It's I've been talked, all I you, mate. Up, Ross, I brought up gravitational redshift, which we haven't talked about. We barely talked about LIGO. We've spent this whole time talking about stuff you wanted to talk about, like relative densities. That was your presentation. All right. Let's be fair then. Uh, if that's how you uh, you feel, uh, I'll give you the ball, Grayson, to move us into something you brought up in your intro, and uh, we'll try to unpack that. All right. Okay, so I would like an explanation for gravitational redshift from Ross, where you actually have a difference in the passage of time based on your height from the ground. Like, the, the lower you are, like, time is passing differently for you. And you can measure this, you can predict, you can use GR to predict exactly how many microseconds of a difference it should be, and it comes out exactly as predicted. How do you explain that, Ross, in your relative density model? To be honest, I've got absolutely no idea what you're talking about. It sounds like absolute pseudoscience to me. And it sounds like something that you, know, you make up to try and obscure the fact that, you know, if the more you can obscure something and make it look like it's not understandable to the average person, the more you can get away with looking clever with, without actually ever saying All anything. right, we're doing I some mean, meta discussion here. So, uh, Grayson, if you want to take like 15 seconds and explain right quick how this ties into our debate topic tonight, and then we'll give Ross a chance to respond. Uh, okay, well, I felt that that was entirely obvious how this ties into our debate topic. It's a, it's a direct measurement of gravity using a prediction from general relativity, measuring the curvature of space-time, which you are literally measuring in the time dilation effects at a sub-millimeter level. It's not my fault that Ross doesn't understand what was done in this experiment or is not familiar with them. All he's offered so far in response is his own personal incredulity and just All saying... All right, we're back oh. to the meta. All right, let's, let's give it over to Ross to respond. And then, uh, uh, Ross, if you want to move into something you brought up in your intro, feel free. Well, actually, this does segue into something I'm talking about because he's mentioning the theory of relativity. And this theory of relativity was absolutely uh, brought into existence to explain why we can't detect any motion of the Earth. Now, I'd like to know why, with the motion of the Earth being you know, one and a third times the speed of sound, just on its axis, as we're hurtling about 10 times faster than a railgun projectile in our orbital speed, our second mm -hmm. slower speed, is how does objects falling downwards, 9.8 meters second per second squared, um, going so many times further fast sideways in order to create the illusion of falling straight down? How do you explain that just using gravity? Like It's actually projecting things forwards and backwards at different speeds relative to every position on the Earth, every single one must be unique. How does gravity 
uh, force of attraction of bigoty explain that, especially when something is in front of our orbital speed, would mean it's actually being pulled away from the Earth as the Earth is racing into it to create the illusion that's dropping at exactly the same rate as something on the back side of the Earth. Um, go in the opposite direction, as I explained when I used my diagram. Yeah, Can you... I think that it's just fundamentally you not understanding the conservation of momentum. Obviously, like, obviously. obviously. No, like it, it is kind of obvious, at least from what I'm understanding of what you're like, I'm trying to wrap my head around what your issue even is. It seems like you just don't okay. understand that when things move, everything on the earth is moving like together. So it all starts out having that same starting point of initial momentum. So the only the forces that are different are what's going to cause the differential movements and it's going to be attracted to the center of gravity of earth so i don't understand what you're not understanding about that okay well let's just use an airplane as an example this was actually a debate i was going to be doing with somebody else today but um, i don't know what happened to the guy it's a pilot um i was going to bring up the fact that if you took off with the momentum of the earth um towards the east so you take off from the east you're already going a thousand miles per hour you add 500 miles per hour just uh -huh. rounded figure so you're going 1500 miles per hour now if you turned around and started uh did a 180 and started traveling west that would now mean that you're traveling backwards a thousand miles per hour as you're going forwards 500 miles per hour so you're actually going backwards of some total of 500 miles per hour in order to create the illusion you're going forwards 500 miles per hour that's ridiculous now so Ockham's razor you would just be going fed. 500 miles an hour in the reverse direction so what are you talking about like if what's okay, that i understand I, I i literally so what you're saying the, the the plane initially uh takes off and it's going in the same direction of earth's movement right yeah, 1,500 miles an hour. So if it initially had, you said what, 1,000 miles per hour is your initial, and then it's it's moving at 500 miles an hour to the east, right? That was your your start, right? Yeah, some so total of 1,500. At that point, the plane is moving 500 miles an hour to the east, okay? 1,500. No, 500. It's, it's, 1500. it's starting at 500. Because it's starting at 1,000. Because the ground and the plane were both moving at 1,000 feet per second, and now they're still moving wow. at 1,000 yeah. feet per second. And the plane is now moving 500 on top of that. So relative to the ground, the plane is moving at 500 miles per hour. Yeah, but as real speed would have to be 1500 no, miles no per hour. There's no such thing as real speed. Speed is absolute. Uh, so it's relative, uh, okay. speed relative to the ground is 500. So now what's your problem with the plane going in the other direction? So, so this is the problem is you have to deny reality and say that speed isn't real. No, speed is relative. That's just a fact. Well, not really. It, it know, is like, a fact. You know, like if you, we, uh. I'm sorry, okay. Ross, but that's just a, it's a basic fact. Okay. Like elementary okay, so. school. All right, fact. then. Well, well, let's try another example. Maybe this will, will be a bit easier for you. Uh, a, a skydiver jumps from a plane. Yeah. Yep. Are you going to say that he's going to continue to retain the inertial speed of the plane as he jumps from it? And so no, he's because there's going to be wind flying. resistance. So there's wind resistance. So the wind, wind resistance, resistance slows him down, yes. But but the wind resistance of the Earth is still keeping him going a thousand miles per hour. He took off with in the first. The place. wind is rotating with the Earth, Ross. But but how can we have winds going all different directions, different speeds, different heights? But because there's differences in pressure that cause wind, like internally. Yeah. The, overall, the atmosphere is rotating with the Earth. That's nonsense. We couldn't have it's winds not if that. That's a fact. We couldn't have winds if that is the case. That's not true. You have, differences like a, in, you, you have differences in pressure that are caused by the sun differentially heating parts of the earth as it rotates. Or it could be just the sun moving around above us that's causing that as well. Nope. Yes, that works equally as well. In fact, it's far more sensible because if we consider a tropical storm, for example, a cyclone, a winds that reach a speed of, say, 175 miles per hour are absolutely destructive. They will destroy villages, forests, okay, plantations, yeah, sure. totally wipe things out. And yet perfectly still air is going a thousand miles per hour. So this wind is going barely a fifth the speed of perfectly still air. And I, causes I just all don't think that you're understanding effect. what relative speeds are. Like the, the, the speed. Oh, obviously of, not, because the, I only believe saying, real, in real speeds. Th there's no such thing as real, real speed relative to what? What's your reference point, Ross? Well, the ground. But if the, the ground, ground is, is moving, then there's no such. It's all relative. Yeah, but the ground isn't moving. We've you got no method of detection. That, we can no, you cannot de demonstrate that it is moving. Yes, we can. No, you cannot. You haven't never yeah, had. We can you never use will. a ring laser gyroscope. We can show that it's moving. You know, we can show and that, that, that exactly rotating. talks you about the very observations. It, you can look at observations in the sky that show that the Earth is revolving around the sun. That just shows that those things are moving. As you said, it's all relative. 
from the point of view of the earth, yeah. earth's so what, perfectly this still. This argument that you're making right here is basically just that, well, listen, listen, okay, you could say that the that I drove my car 60 miles per hour down my street, or you could just say that the entire universe moved at 60 miles per hour around my car that stood still. And exactly, and which is the most sensible argument. Technically, those are mathematically and physically equivalent situations, but everybody would laugh at you and call you silly if you tried to to say one versus the other. And that's Rod's exactly. strategy right now. That's actually, it's, that's your strategy because you're, you're saying that's exactly what it is doing. Whereas I'm trying to say, when I finally finished saying this point about the storm, is that the storm is actually rotating in a circular fashion, whether it's be anti-clockwise or clockwise, depending on which side of the equator it is on. Um, how is that possible then that the entire thing <clears throat> is drifting five times faster with the speed of the Earth? Plus then also, let's not ignore the orbital speed, which is a massive, massive speed that you say this is also going. I guess you're just going to hand wave dismiss this as relative as well. But let's yes, just obviously assume, that's the fact. Let's just assume we'll ignore the orbital speed for now. We're just going to deal with the rotational speed on its axis, you know, of a thousand miles per hour. These 200 mile per hour winds are causing utter and utter destruction, and yet they're moving in a circular pattern, going the same speed around the epicenter of the storm, and yet it's also drifting sideways with this impossible. What's uh, it doing relative to the ground, Ross? Of the ground. What's, What's it doing, doing relative to the ground? What it's doing relative to the ground is spinning on the spot and moving whichever direction go. the forces dictate it wants to go. Yep. And yeah, it's not so, an issue. So the rotation of the, the ground is wait, wait. Okay, you talked about I want to I want to illustrate the difference because you said that's what I'm doing with the car moving versus the rest of the universe moving, but really uh you're the one saying that it's not the rest of the universe that's moving. It's not the sun or the galaxies that are I'm moving. I'm talking around. about the universe. Really what's mate. happening? You're talking about the storm and the wait, earth. Come on, come on. Don't interrupt me. Yep. Really? Oh, no. what, okay, hold on. Okay, what, one on. second, Ross. Don't one interrupt. second. I don't want to put you on mute. Just give uh, Grayson a second here. Just hold your I'm thought. I'm just liking to keep it relevant to the argument. Right, don't interrupt me. Uh, like I said, just give him a space and you absolutely will have some time to respond. You're saying it's not relevant, but you were the one who told me that I am the one in my analogy saying that the rest of the universe is moving around my car and my car is actually standing still. I'm only illustrating the analogy here. The car is the earth. You're saying the earth is standing still and the rest of the universe is moving around the, the stationary earth. But in reality, that's you saying your car is standing still and the rest of the universe is moving at 60 miles per hour around your car. That's the analogy. That's why you're doing it and not me. I just wanted to make that point clear. No, no, we're talking about a storm here now. Yeah, try, try and stick to the topic. I'm talking about a storm rotating at maximum speeds of 200 miles per hour around an epicenter, which would mean that part of that storm is actually only moving about 800 miles per hour because of the spin of the Earth beneath it. The other side of the Earth, at other side of the storm is moving 1,200 miles per hour, and yet all of the winds relative to the Earth are only moving 200 miles per hour each, as though the Earth is standing perfect. To the Earth. perfect. You just explained it. All right. As though the Earth Hold is standing on. perfectly Let him still. finish, to be fair. Yeah, so, so how is it that winds can be moving, you know, five times slower than perfectly still air and cause such huge destructive forces? Because they're moving at a speed relative to the Earth, and their destructive force is a function of their speed, the wind speed relative to the Earth and the things that the wind is actually coming into contact with and hitting, like houses and trees. That is the number that is determinative of how much damage is being done, is the relative wind speed relative to the stuff it's hitting. That's what's important, okay? The relative speeds. Everybody should be able to understand this. It's very intuitive and straightforward. It's completely non-intuitive whatsoever. Because as we know, if we take anything, like we said with the skydiver jumping from the plane, what happens to him is wind resistance. When yep. we take anything of the earth and throw it through the air, it suffers wind resistance. Yep. The earth itself is of the earth. So it should be moving through the earth and suffering this wind resistance. So the what? perfectly still so the perfectly still air, let me finish, mate, before you have your little girly little pissy fit. Is it? Oh man, that was it's crazy! Yeah, right. One second that. there, Grayson. Muslim finishes thought. <laughs> he never the finished earth itself thought. Would, would be moving through the earth, through the air, through the atmosphere, as though the air is perfectly still. In which case, we would always be facing a thousand mile per hour headwind 
uh, racing through us and would be charging through it so fast at the speed of 10 times faster than a railgun projectile that would be leaving it behind us in a huge comet tail. It would be absolutely impossible. And these speeds are an absolute necessity for your spinning space ball to even be possible in the first place. It's all mathematical garb. When we start to understand that the Earth itself is stationary, Brian, fixed at the bottom finished. of the universe, then the wind doing as the wind does makes perfect sense. It is all logical and intuitive. Your whole idea is absolute nonsense. Every last bit of it. Okay, are you done, Ross? You finally I'm done? done, Jason. Okay. Yes. So, so you literally fun. said that the Earth is having wind resistance as it moves. Uh, yeah. The Earth is going through wind? Like it's a ball that you're throwing on a windy day and the Earth is just getting hit by winds as it moves through space? Like you think that there are like, there's an atmosphere in space, there's wind in space that the Earth is moving through? It is ludicrous. You no, should, no, I'm just saying that if there understand. is an atmosphere around the Earth and the Earth itself being of the Earth, as everything is, then there's no reason why it would mean? drag the atmosphere with it. I've already used that example with my vacuum chamber experiment to show that gravity does not hold gases down whatsoever. Yes, gases are free to roam as they will and will fill the entire container surrounding okay. them given let's the available time. Let's, let's address that because you did bring it up in your opening. So first of all, sure. completely incorrect. Whenever you have an actual like a, a canister or the atmosphere itself, as you go up in height, in elevation, the density of the air goes down. And every everybody can agree with this. It's It's a basic fact. So density. Okay, cool. Yes. And so as you go higher and higher and higher, the density of the air gets less and less and less and less and less as it asymptotically approaches zero. So you never have the situation like you falsely painted at the beginning of your opening where you said that in the atmosphere, you have a point of high pressure and a point of low pressure. And for some reason, they're just not mixing, even though that's physically what would happen because you have a gradient and you can measure this gradient. Right now, everyone at home can measure the gradient in the atmosphere. You can literally like get a barometer app on your phone, measure the density of atmosphere at the bottom of your room and at the top, and you can measure a difference. It's less dense the higher you go. Yeah, are you kidding me? That's a fact. That's a fact? Yes, you In can measure room. it yourself. In a room. Yep. I thought you said get a room. I was going to say with <laughs> with the theory, <laughs> what's going on here? I want to no, just no, inject it, right quick. It's easily measurable. I mean, I would <laughs> highly encourage everybody like get a barometer app on your phone. Your an iPhone has a barometer built into it. You can measure temp, it can measure pressure differences and you can measure the pressure at the bottom of your room and at the top and you'll see that it, there's a slightly less amount of pressure at the top of your room. Well, I was just trying okay. to I was trying to inject before you reiterated. Uh, I put a poll up earlier. Uh, so is gravity a hoax? 24% has voted yes. 68% voted no. And then 7% said gravity backwards is my orc name. How many of you did I uh, get to say yitavarg? Anyway, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> And continue on. But that's our poll right now. So 24 to 68. And then we got our joke uh, answer. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, hopefully helps reset the tone. But go ahead there, Ross. I'll give you a chance to uh, respond. Right. Yeah, cheers. So um, we could use a similar example inside of in a swimming pool. How at the bottom of the pool has a greater pressure gradient, has a greater pressure. But that's simply due to the volume of the water above you pressing down upon you. And as you get higher gravity. and higher towards the surface, it decreases. No, it's just because of the density Except of the water gravity. itself. You, oh, it's gravity. No, no. It it's is. just the a volume of the water and the density of the water that creates that gradient. And Why when is you it reach pressing the down on you, Ross? You said that because the, of the volume of water is water pressing water down. Why is it pressing down? Because of the volume of the water and the density. Now, if you're done interrupting, I will finish my point. I'm not done interrupting. Why down? Because of the weight of water. It has density weight. and weight. And then the volume of it determines how much pressure it is putting upon you. Yes. That Why is what physics down? is all about. Why down? Because it's physical and everything needs a base to, to be built. physical upon. too. Left and right are physical. Why down? Yeah, because that's the way it works. Oh, because that's just the way it is. Because you don't know how to explain it. Even though gravity I, I, explains, I explain it, it to you. Well. I explained it to you with acoustics, how we have higher notes and lower notes are more bass. In physics, we need a bass. Everything depends upon a bass. Oh. You can't build a house without <laughs> a bass. The bass is the bottom. The earth is the bottom of the universe. That's how physics works. Bro, Get you're just doing 
you're, you're literally just doing now, 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 hey, no, no, I'll give you a chance in a second, Jason. I'll give you a right chance now. in a second, Jason. I'm still making my point right. because we're going back to the atmosphere now. Let's, and while we let's, have a pressure let's take 10 seconds. Air, All right, just to, to be fair, Ross, let's take 10 seconds to wrap this up and we'll hand it back to Grayson I'm to trying bounce the to. idea. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm trying Ross. To. I'm nearly there. And it's the same sort of thing happens in the medium of air. We have a uh, pressure gradient due to the volume of air above us. It's a f finite amount of air, so the higher we go, the less air there is on you, so therefore less pressure. Okay, so this is the exact point that I was making in my introduction, where ultimately the flat earthers don't have an explanation for why gravity is downward. They can't, they just have to assume the direction is down and beg the question to start with. And when I asked Ross why, he started doing stream of consciousness word associations of saying well look base over here I mean it, it sounds the same as this word base even though they have two different definitions in different contexts because they're homophones i'm just going to say that they both mean the same thing and it's some sort of cosmic pattern that i know oh, the base requires the base and that's why down it's literally just meaningless gobbledygook it's just word association no from something that doesn't know the science there's no such thing as coincidence there's a reason why these words have the same thing. It's the reason why the word compass also means the, the instrument used to draw a circle or also the same instrument that magnetically points towards the centre of the circle. Yeah, you know, It's how we draw our maps in the first place, why the sun is all-encompassing. You know, we use words for a very specific reason, even if we've lost the... Um, the current usage, you know, the origins, of, you know, where they came from is in epistemology. Um, basically, there's no such thing as coincidence. The base is the wow. requirement for how we have everything. There is a universal yeah. up and a universal down, and everything finds its place according to relative density. You don't have to ask why down when it's just is. A child understands intuitively the moment it drops something, it's not going to drop up, it's not going to drop sideways, it always drops down. This is just nature. It's a very nature of existence. The very first law of physics is to make the observation, not to start making up nonsense. Why not? Why doesn't it go this way? It doesn't do it go that way because it's just the law of physics. Everything has a universal downward tendency well, unless it's lighter than air. So here's the thing is that in science, we do have an explanation for why things fall down. It's because they're falling towards the mass of the earth. That's what causes the direction. So it's not like we just have to say, well, look, okay, no, science is descriptive. Wait, don't interrupt me, Ross. Okay, come on. We don't have to just say, oh, well, science is descriptive and that's just the way it is. It just is down because that's why. Don't ask anything further. Don't ask any questions about why down. That would be problematic because the flat earthers can't answer that. So you just have to say, look, it just is the way it is. We have no explanation for why even though the other science with gravity can perfectly explain why very very easily it offers that explanatory power but the alternatives the relative density the electromagnet gravity like none of these stuff can explain why the direction is downward and that is why they cannot explain gravity and why their explanation for gravity utterly fails and why gravity follows general relativity we know it quite well we can make the predictions and they can't well, your explanation is nothing more than an assumption, an unproven assumption, which has been proven wrong by the Tamarack Mind Mysteries and similar. And so anything that is, you know, that Occam's razor says that anything using assumptions can be dismissed where the more simple explanation is easily explains it as due to relative density. Is that if, it's, if the medium is insufficiently dense to give resistance to it, then the thing will sink. If it's sufficient to give resistance to it, it will float. And if the thing itself is lighter than the medium, it will rise upwards like the so basketball at the bottom of the swimming pool. I got a question for you then. Why is it you're saying that, look, look, if the thing beneath it is sufficiently dense to support it, then it won't fall. And if it's not, then it will go through. So why does it matter the thing beneath it? Why doesn't it matter how dense the thing above it is? If the thing above it is less dense, why doesn't it just fall up? Because the less dense thing does not give resistance force to give why it not? buoyancy. But why not? Because of the lack of resistance from its density. <laughs> wait, wait. So the thing doesn't provide resistance because of the lack of resistance? Circular a, a bit much? Yeah. That's circular reasoning, Ross. Well, what it's I'm not. It's, for, it's, it's pretty obvious. That, you're saying that it's important the density of the thing below the object because yeah. it can offer resistance because it's beneath it. But why can't yeah. the thing above it offer resistance or support? Why does the support or resistance only matter if it's below it and not above it or to the left and right? Because it's about relative density, right? Yeah, because it lacks the density. 
because everything has already organized itself according to density and it, it organized itself from the bottom up. Okay, let's 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 uh, we have a circular ball, right? And we have equal density in every single direction. The medium is equally dense in every direction for 50 miles. Which way is the object going to move? Say again, what what what? If you have an object, right? A, a, a like a lead ball and it's yeah, I'm not by a medium that's equal density in every single direction for like a long time. Are you, are you talking about are you going to move? Are you talking about air? It doesn't matter what the medium is. It could be air, it could be water, it could be oil, whatever. Well, if a medium is mercury, it's just going to float. It depends on the relative densities. Okay, this is a very heavy lead exactly. ball, but let's just it doesn't matter what what whatever medium you want, dude. Like we could do water, we could do air. So not mercury. It doesn't matter. Just pick a medium. Well, if I say mercury, I'll say it's going to float. A lead ball floats in mercury. Well, an iron one will. A lead one will well, probably simulate. Okay, I, I don't care what the medium is, man. Accept the situation and and ask me if it's if it's a uniform density in all direction, and it's the density differences that determine the 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 motion that'll have. And let's just say the air, the medium is air. You have a lead ball that's introduced. Where what direction is it going to go? It will go down. And why will it go down when the density was the same in every direction? Because air offers no resistance factor, and air is obviously already sitting on a, some sort of surface that has a resistance factor that's so, that given buoyancy to the air, and it will go down towards that surface. Same as it will so, in water, but it won't go as fast because water gives more resistance because it's more dense than air. So, so if we had this experiment, right, and we were you were looking at it at a camera, and we like rotated the camera so you no longer know which way is down and which way is up, and you just have this lead ball, and it's going to get let go of, and you have to predict which direction it's going to move in and you're you can do any kind of density measurements you want but it's an it's a room that is equal in every direction it's a it's a cube shaped room you don't know which way's up which way's down how do you determine which way it's going to move well obviously because, because i know we're not in outer space because you know the universe has a base and that is the yeah the plane but how do you term, determine what direction that is if you if you're saying that the, it's the bottom of the main universe it's always down Always but how do down. you know where down is if you're in this room or you're not in this room, the camera's in this room and you don't know, you're just, you, you can control this camera and you have to determine which way this thing is going to move when it's let go of. How it do you know? It will tell you which way down is. It will tell you by its own actions because it's yeah, more dense than the air. You need to predict it, Ross. This is science. You have to make a prediction based on your model. I did. Downwards. <laughs> but you don't know which direction that is. Tell me, you're supposed the to predict. Ball I need you to the predict. Before the ball moves, you need to predict which direction it's going to move, which direction will be down. And we could but predict they, using gravity. You don't need to make these predictions for your silly hypothetical density. game. Right? These See, are your Ryan, silly he's, hypothetical games. He's talking game. over the end of my question. <laughs> you always get on to me for interrupting him. But God. All right, all right, all right. If that, that, that does sound fair. So uh, I, I yeah. wanted to get out the end Let's of my ahead. question. I just want to ask, if we are using our scientific models to do science and make a prediction, so before this ball is released... I can use my model to make a prediction for which direction it will move and which direction down is based on where the majority of the Earth's mass is relative to this ball. But you need to make a prediction based on the relative densities. And the way we've set up this experiment, it's a equal density in every direction. It's completely symmetrical. You cannot use density differences to make a prediction. How, how do you know where the Earth is in this instance? You would have to have that information. I don't know. You'd have to, yeah, like, well, either you could do that with, like, a radar. You could bounce something off of it and, and determine, like, through seismology where the Earth is. You'd have to figure yeah. out which direction the Earth's mass was relative to the room. I would, I would okay, admit so, that. So here in reality, we don't need to do all that stuff. We already know that the Earth is going to be downwards. If we're up above the surface of the Earth, it'll it. always be down. Question. No, I'm not. I, yes, it's, a, it's a known thing. You're if, you know something, if you know something, you don't have to guess. You no, don't but, have to okay, predict Here's the thing, though, is that I'm asking known. you to predict or to explain why things go down, and you're already just begging the question that they already do. You're not giving an explanation for why. That's right. 
I shouldn't have to. I don't need to invent anything new that's already been observed since the beginning of well, time. It's called the begging the question fallacy, Iron Horse, and it is a logical fallacy. And by the way, so is the etymological fallacy that you were using earlier about using a word's origin in order to like infer about its its meaning. Like Those are both logical fallacies that you're using. Uh, absolutely not. It's the very reason we have the word gravity is because it comes from the word gravitas, which actually means weight. It does not mean attraction and force due to bigoty. It doesn't mean bending and warping of space time. It just simply means weight. And anything that has weight is a weight determined compared to something else. You know, the weight of something in water is less than some, the same thing as the weight of it in air. So it's all relative density. But again, you cannot explain why the weight is pushing down instead of yes, up to left or right. Yes, I can, because of its density relative to its medium. That's but all that matters. Density, but it, we already said, if the density is equal in all directions relative to the medium, you still have a weight, but your model cannot explain why. It can, because it's the weight of the object relative to the medium. The medium is but, but, insufficient wait, 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 wait. to give it buoyancy. It's not going to give it buoyancy at all in any direction. Okay, it's just look, going to drop Ross, into a plate. You need to understand system. this. The, the relationship with the density is equal up, down, left, right, every direction. You have the same exactly. density relationship. You can't tell just from looking at the densities what direction is down. But it's still the weight goes down for some reason. And it cannot be because of the density because that's equal in every direction. Well, if you're standing on your head, it's dropping up. You know, so it's this is again, just getting your, absurd, your terms, man. You're not having serious responses. Now, your terms are completely relative, aren't they? You know, you you're can not call it whatever you want. You're not serious responses anymore. You're just no, you can call it, well, because your your questions are no longer sensible. They're meaningless. It's very sensible. It's it actually it is the crux of your entire model. Everything in physics behaves in accordance with the universal up and down function, which is no, determined by There's relative There's no density. universal up or down function. You're making that up. No, no, you, you're the one that says there is no universe up and down because you want to believe in your fantasy ball so hard that you have yeah. to have this force of gravitational attraction so that things on the bottom can cling to it as you hurtle through a vacuum of no space. Harder. Whereas we don't need, if we uh, remove all assumptions and you know you know nothing to start with, and then you start making observations in nature, then you will see that if you hold a rock and you let go of a rock, you've removed the force of resistance that your hand has given it, but the force you've applied to it by lifting it up has an equal and opposite reaction and it will fall back to the place of rest no one's from where you picked it from. You're debating yeah. astronomy because nobody's debating that. I mean, well, we'll we are because you're, you're saying why doesn't it go upwards or sideways? Yes. You're yes. the one asking that question. So yes, you tell and me you why can't it doesn't. Answer it. All right. I already have. You well, already have the question. more dense than the air. All right. You so assume more dense than the air. It seems to me, guys, down down guys, just one with. second. Like I said, I don't want to put either of you on mute. You've been doing great. Uh, but it seems like we may need to move into some new territory. We will go into Q and A, and we'll let our speakers have a little break and let them have, uh, uh, you know, a bathroom break and uh, get some refreshments at that time. Uh, so uh, get your questions in. Uh, we will move to that Q and A shortly. Uh, hit the like button. I've given you no option, as you can see in the poll. Um, but let's try to push into some new territory. I think, there, fellas, because. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, th I think the audience is uh, understanding where you may disagree uh, on, on this one and, uh, you know, the nuances that you have in that disagreement. So if you have something that has not gotten uh, hashed out, let's uh, let's try to hit that. Yeah, well, I agree. That did not have an explanation for any of the evidence I offered from gravitational redshift, gravitational waves that were measured by LIGO. No explanation for any of these things. Like all these things necessitate that space-time is curved and that's what causes gravity like the, these are the evidence to support that he said i just assumed that gravity is space-time but this is the evidence it's not just an assumption it's backed up using the scientific method yeah well i, I call that all absolute co complete pseudoscience uh the, the idea that we could detect a, a gravitational wave from thousands and millions of light years away is absolutely yep. ludicrous wow. uh, light itself Light itself exists uh, instantaneously. It is the fluorescence of the noble gases in our atmosphere that give us our light that occur instantaneously. Light does not travel. Um, so the whole idea that these lights are traveling from outer space is just absolute ridiculous. 
nonsense that you guys have to make up. You've, you've been supporting this lie since like 1543 when Copernicus first put the ball spinning around the sun. Okay, um, you've okay, made up, we got it, we got it. Yeah, it's a little old lady who swallows a fly. You've made up lie after lie after lie you until eventually you've swallowed a horse and the whole spinning space ball is dead, of course. Okay, you, you made your point. Okay, so, but in reality, okay, these are not just things that we have assumed. We've used the models to generate a testable prediction. We test the prediction and it's like incredibly accurate. Like you can, I mean, contrary to what Iron Horse believes, like these experiments have been done at every level in the atmosphere. They've been done in satellites. They've been done in James Webb Space Telescope. They've been done outside of Earth's atmosphere. I know he doesn't believe that because he doesn't believe anybody's been outside of Earth's atmosphere, but that's a problem for beyond this debate. The point is, we have the actual data, the measurements. We can exclude other explanations like relative density for the reasons I've ever already outlined that you're literally just, it's its begging the question. It's a logical fallacy. You're assuming, your, you're assuming your conclusion before you even start that there's a downward acceleration. You can't start with a downward acceleration. You have to explain the downward acceleration. No, no, no. I'll just say that we allow a downward acceleration because of the lack of resistance of the medium of air. It's not sufficient enough to resist the thing of mass from accelerating through it until reaching a point of terminal velocity. Whereas the ground itself ceases it from dropping any further because it's dense enough to resist it. We seems don't need like, anything uh, further than that. It seems like we're really hitting a wall uh, on this one, honestly, guys. Uh, so it might be a good idea, like I say, to uh, move into that Q&A shortly and uh, let our speakers have uh, a break. Uh, but uh, once again, if there's anything that we might want to move into, because it seems like a lot of these subjects we're, we're just uh, kind of reiterating. So, Well, I mean, yeah, we, we, could, we could demonstrate that light actually does travel and is not instantaneous, but then Ross would just deny that those experiments exist or he would say that they're a hoax or that it's a conspiracy. So as we wrap up, I would just like to say, because... I mean, any evidence that I bring forward that is tested, peer reviewed, like hundreds of scientists collaborations, like way too big to fake. Ross is going to say that it's a hoax. It's a conspiracy. So I want to know who who is doing this hoax? Who's who's doing this gravity hoax? Because we have scientists on every country on Earth doing research in the physics of gravity. And if it was a hoax, at least one of them somewhere would have figured it out if they're not in on it. So is every scientist in on this? Who is doing this hoax, Ross? Because there's countries that are geopolitical enemies that all agree that gravity is real, even though it would be in their geopolitical advantage for like China, if they figured out that the US had been lying about gravity this whole time, they'd, they would point it out and say, here, look, we've dedicated our resources. We've got the scientific equipment to prove that the US has been lying about gravity. And then suddenly, now the rest of the world shifts towards a more China-trusting geopolitical order, and they win. So why aren't they doing that? Why are all the countries on Earth in agreement that gravity exists? Uh, well, thank you for your summary there. And um, I'm sure you didn't mean to introduce another topic to it because we're just doing a summary. So I'll, I'll ignore your questions. Honestly, uh, basically, um, I don't mind if you guys want to launch into that discussion. Like yeah, just said, the we, last, we don't I wasn't have doing a to. summary. We don't uh, have just, to just stop. The last topic. <laughs> last topic. Okay, well, I, I would actually like to address the one you, you were bringing up just prior to that, since I thought you were doing a summary and I was going to address it real quickly. Is that you brought up the fact of satellites. You're saying things don't go above the atmosphere, whereas I don't deny that whatsoever. I think our atmosphere reaches 12 to 14 miles high. That's where the atmospheric gases cease fluorescing. So anything that goes higher than 12 to 14 miles has reached uh, outer space. It get, reaches up to about 70 miles high. Um, and so, of course, we can have satellites in that above the stationary plane of Earth, which work according to the maglev type um, gravitational or anti-gravitational forces. The maglev uh, thing works quite uh, well. A satellite would be absolutely impossible on your spinning space ball uh, because, again, the orbital speed of something equivalent to Mach 88, even though we don't measure Mach outside of the atmosphere, um, even though it's equivalent to Mach 88, um, as again, if we go back to my diagram, which I showed earlier, showing how something one side of the Earth going that direction with the orbital speed would be going away from the Earth, whereas the things going behind it are going that way, things going that way and that way, whatever, they're all over the shop. Um, satellites would be absolutely impossible on the spinning spaceball model. However, if we have things like the satellites or maglev devices 
in our atmosphere, uh, they can absolutely work. And that could so satellites aren't entirely impossible on the flat Earth, and they all right. We got to pass. They the actually ball. make far more sense than the spinning okay. space ball. So I just want to say real quick that speed is relative. You don't feel absolute speed; you feel changes in momentum. So that explains everything that Ross just said. Momentum is conserved. So this is a basic introductory level physics concepts. Go to your local high school physics teacher and they can explain this to you if you're still confused about it, Ross. But I really want you to address what I asked you about who is doing this hoax of gravity in your review. Well, it's just something that they, everybody's agreed upon because they've all been convinced that we live on a spinning space ball. And so they haven't really given themselves the opportunity to question it or doubt it. Uh, whereas the flat earthers are the ones who are doing all the questioning and stuff. And because we don't make a career of it, um, obviously we're considered you know, on the fringe of the of science. Um, we're not really taken seriously in most cases. Um, yeah, so it's the flat earthers who are the ones who are doing all the, the questioning so, of things. It's not China, it's not Russia, it's not America. Well, they're just going along with it because they're making a huge hoax out of humanity and making billions of dollars out of it doing so. Okay, so I'd like to show that, that the papers that we're testing this, that I've shown you tonight, were both from the last 10 years. So you're saying that nobody's testing this, they all just assume that it's true because that's what they've been told, but the scientists are testing this. They built LIGO to test this and see if they could in fact detect gravitational waves, which they did. It was a confirmed prediction that they tested. So they are testing this. That Cavendish experiment that I showed you was from 2022. They are currently testing these things. This is not flat earthers. These are actual scientists testing general relativity to see if its predictions are accurate. I've worked together with scientists who specialize in general relativity testing. I took cosmology courses from somebody that actually does test general relativity as a living. He's paid to try to poke holes in general relativity and try to find areas where general relativity fails. He's getting his paycheck to try to debunk general relativity. That's what he does for a living. He does tests to see if it works. People are doing this. So it's just a lie to say that nobody's doing this and they just assume that it's true and that the only people researching this and testing it are flat earthers. That's just a lie. Okay, so to tie a bit of a bow on that then is to say that there is such a thing as confirmation bias. And there is also such a thing as what they call, you know, what we observe with, the, say, the double slit experiment, is how things observe completely differently when you're observing them to how when they're not observed. So there's quite often the fact that it's actually the observer himself and their expectations which actually create the results that they are seeking. Um, that's an undeniable fact, and it's the next stage in science is where which we we need to try and overrule. So if you go in with a completely open mind without any sort of expectations, you might find something completely different, which again ties all the way back to their Eratosthenes. Whereas if he had have set out with the confirmation bias that he's out to prove a stationary Earth with a local sun, he would have proven exactly that. So okay. it's all about what you've preconceived in your mind. It, it, you're going to find results to match that. Okay, Ross, final question, final question. So is it all just confirmation bias? And it's just our own biases from as observers that are explain it, explaining why. When LIGO was able to make a detection, they were able to say, look, we detected a gravitational wave signal that is corresponding to exactly the waveform that we would expect for a neutron star collision. And we detected this at this exact quadrant of the night sky. Now they send out their they they send out a message to all the local observatories on Earth and say, "Could you guys look at this spot of sky and tell us, did you observe a gamma ray burst of light coming from this region of the sky 1.7 seconds after our observation?" And they found it. Is that just a confirmation bias? They predicted exactly what they should find and then they found it exactly that and it's not like you could just say, "Look, I'm going to find a gamma ray burst right here. And then there's going to be a gamma ray burst right there. Is that just a coincidence? Is that confirmation bias? How do you explain that? Well, I don't know enough about it personally, but I can say then that if gravity exists universally everywhere, why would we have to look at one particular spot in the universe in order to see it when it should be everywhere observable all around us and say this LIGO should be able to detect it everywhere yes. all the time, not it just can. in one specific so, little part in outer space it, due to some gamma rays. Yeah, It, it can. It, it can, actually. What you're referring to is called the gravitational wave background, and it's a constant hum of gravitational waves that are detectable in every direction. It's analogous to the cosmic microwave background. 
and we can and have detected the gravitational wave background like you're talking about. That's just a hum from everywhere. The difference between that and what I'm talking about with this specific observation is the wavelength of the gravitational waves. The wavelengths for gravitational waves in the, in the background are just really long wavelength. This one, though, is exactly characteristic. It has an exact waveform that is characteristic of a rare event in the universe. That's why we could only find it in this particular spot, because it's from a neutron star collision, which is pretty rare. It doesn't happen very often. And it causes a gamma ray burst and a burst of gravitational waves. And we've seen that happen, thus verifying beyond any shadow of doubt that gravity is real and exists. So you just said we've seen that. I have yeah. not seen that. Humans have seen that, Ross. Would you rather I use well, that? Well, so I have to take your word for it. This should be something I should be able to look up on, find a YouTube on, and yeah. see for myself. Can you I do can. that? I'll send can you I... the paper. I will send you the paper. The paper? Yes. No, I, I want publish this. This is a visual probably. thing. This is a visual thing. I should be able to see the video of it and see a gravitational wave for myself. Would you like to see the waveforms that they measured in their paper? I can show it to you. I don't want to see waveforms that have been measured on paper. I want to see what they saw that you said we've all seen. Oh, wait, wait. That's a paper. Sorry, Ryan. Yeah. I keep sharing the, the wrong paper here. Um, I will show you. Um, and, and we can just wrap up after I, I show you this one. Sorry about that. I'm trying to find. No, I think you're just wasting our time many, because you don't have a video. Over. You are not showing us the wave. Here's no, no just look up, just look up this event. It's called GW170817. It's this is the observation where they had gravitational waves 1.7 seconds before the gamma rays from the same event. Here's the picture. Here is what the actual gravitational wave signals look like. This is at LIGO in Washington. This is at LIGO in Louisiana. You can see the actual gravitational wave form right there. That's the signal. It was identical in both, thus confirming this is an actual real signal not just noise this is what it looked like when it hit both of their detectors and then we can look at here's here's a further breakdown showing the signal itself the raw data right here and you can see where in the sky it's coming from right here but i know you don't like this because it's a sphere but here's the region of the sky where the gravitational wave came from and then it was later verified from an actual other observation of the gamma rays from a whole other observation observatory. Different owners, different operators, different funders, completely independent. So that's what you need to explain if you're saying gravity gravity is not real. Here's the proof I'm, that it is. I'm saying it's completely open to interpretation. If you want it to be that, that's what it will be for you. Simple as that. Wow. If you really want it, you'll find what you want. Wow, so and just a complete hand wave dismissal because of your own incredulity. Well, it's exactly the same going back to Eratosthenes. If he wants it to be the circumference of a spinning ball, it's the circumference of, well, it's a stationary, a stationary ball back then. So but the if you want it to be the will. circumference they, of that, they just that's what it, it is. Existence. If you that, want that, it to be the circumference it. of the equator, that's what it is. So this could be anything you want it to be. So wait, wait, wait. You're saying that it's just, uh, they just because they wanted to see a gamma ray burst from a very particular place in the sky at an exact time point that they just manifested it and they just saw that gamma ray burst. It's a coincidence. They just wanted to see it. So they did. That's well, all how could got. somebody else say it then if it's down the track later on? Because they're, to be they're permanently looking. These observatories are always looking at the sky and they mark down when they get little hits. So they knew they, they they recorded the gamma ray burst and then LIGO called them. Hey, wait, did you see a gamma ray burst from this exact quadrant at this exact time? And they say, yeah, actually we did. And they say, oh, that's exactly what we predicted you should see because we saw something two seconds earlier. Uh, yeah, so it could be absolutely anything. No, so. it couldn't. It really could not be absolutely anything. It could no, because you don't the even know. Signal. Across the U.S. Even know in that the universe and is a physical thing. What you don't that? have to keep talking again every time I start trying to respond. I said, you don't even know that the universe is a physical thing. Oh, we they can all be a brain in a vat, Iron Horse. It's all just solipsism all the way down. That's quite entirely possible, too. Okay, so whenever you lose the argument, all of a sudden, it's just, we don't know anything. And it could all be made up and we could all just be dreaming. We, who knows? And nothing could be real. Well, until we actually go to another star or walk on another planet, then it's all just assumption. You know, I've never been to Australia, uh, so I'm just going to assume it's it's just assumption. I, I'm just assuming Australia exists. Uh, who knows? 
You could well, be. I think it's pretty. Ob- it's pretty obvious that if places are documented and we know people live on them and we've been there, then yes, we can confirm that it's true. Well, we I've never been to Australia. I mean, people but have you've never been to other Mars. galaxies. They've Nobody's ever been to Mars. galaxies. Where they millions have, of people live have... in Australia. Okay, now millions of people live here. But... Well, well see, you know, you just you say all those it. people are a hoax because that's your strategy with this. Any any evidence to the contrary, it's just a hoax. They're just making it up. I can't say who or why, but it's just made up because it disagrees I'm, I'm with me. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that anybody that's walked on Mars is lying about it. Because nobody's ever walked on Mars and nobody's lying about it. But many people have walked on Australia, so that, therefore I would assume they're not lying. What about the people that walked it. on the moon? Well, that, they've even admitted that it was animation, it was a hoax, oh, they they've never been. That's there. a lie. That's exactly what uh, Buzz Aldrin said, that you did not see it live on television. He said, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. That was Total animation. Lies. So you are that they are lying. The, the people that say it. that they have walked on the moon, are they lying? Absolutely. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that we were on the record. With All right. Yeah. Every, we're we're, we're going to get signaling. every tag in the book here, guys. What are you trying to do? All right. So uh, maybe it would be a good time to let you guys have a, a, a water uh, – uh, and uh, you know, bathroom break if you need to. Uh, and we're. Gonna... I don't think we need conclusions. I, we we just go right into Q and A. I think we've already had our summarizing uh, bits. All right, well, let's. Uh... Sorry, I'll be back in a sec. All okay. right, all right. We're gonna I'll jump into Q and A. Well, perfect. All righty. <laughs> 